Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? Audio is okay. Ohayo gozaimasu. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let me start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. Uh, and let us pay our respects to their elders past and present. Uh, so welcome to this year's Japan Update, um, themed Peak Japan. Uh, so I'm Shiro Armstrong. I direct the Australia-Japan Research Centre here at the Crawford School at ANU. Uh, and I'm really pleased to co-organise this one-day symposium um, with Fujiwara Ippe from Keio and ANU, who is um, the Japan director for the Australia-Japan Research Centre, and Professor Veronica Taylor, who's the director of the Japan Institute here at the ANU. Um, so with, as with the Japan update each year, we have a panel on the economy um, to bring you up to date on some of the latest thinking and research on the economy, panel on politics and foreign policy, um, and also a panel on society, an aspect on society. And this year, that panel will focus on the demographic challenges that Japan faces. Um, that's part of the reason behind the theme, Peak Japan. Um, Japan's population peaked 10 years ago. Its working age population peaked earlier than that, about 20 years ago from today. Uh, and some might think that Japan's economic strength peaked uh, with the asset bubble bursting uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. Um, it didn't. Um, and the theme we're discussing today isn't peaked Japan, it's peak Japan. Um, so what we're thinking with that is it's really Japan at the top of its game. Uh, in many ways, in many ways, Japan is in peak form. So as we all know, or well, most of us probably know too well, Japan's very prosperous and secure society. Um, it's one of the most technologically advanced, cleanest and rich countries in the world, uh, including being very culturally rich. Uh, so Japan has escaped deflation and its economy has become stronger. Um, Japan has had stable political leadership now for close to six years. Uh, before that, there were six prime ministers in six years. So we seem to have caught Japan's disease and Japan's <laughs> gotten rid of itself of that disease. Um, and Prime Minister Abe has managed the US relationship under Trump as well as any foreign leader has. Um, he's been very active diplomatically. He's also laid the groundwork for improved relations with China. Um, and is due to visit China, or visit Beijing in October with a, a large business delegation. Um, but also, Japan's shown leadership in trade in holding the line on the global economic order against the protectionist threat from the United States and elsewhere. Um, and for us in our region, uh, it's a basis for our prosperity. Uh, Japan, with some help from Australia, of course, led the conclusion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement um, without the United States, and that's the TPP-11 or the CPTPP. Um, Japan also concluded an EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, with the European Union. Um, it was also the first non-ASEAN country to host the ministerial meeting for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP now the second worst acronym behind CPTPP. <laughs> uh, but of course, all these successes, Japan still has challenges. Um, it's not so much that the population has peaked, and that is, presents some problems, but more importantly, it's that the population is aging. Um, so the, we'll hear a lot about that this afternoon. But how Japan manages this demographic transition matters, of course, for Japan, matters for us here in Australia, matters for the region, uh, but globally as well. Japan is systemically important um, in the global economy. Um, but also, South Korea and China and other countries will be watching how Japan handles this, um, handles this transition and learning from Japan's policy innovations and, and the transition. Uh, but this will involve big social changes. Um, they'll be at the forefront of this transition. One of them will be the equal treatment of women in the workplace and in society. Um, you'll notice in the program today, two of our panels, um, we have men in the minority. So that's all too rare in Japan. Um, Japan will have to manage the unprecedented government debt of 240% um, of GDP. Uh, that'll be a big challenge. And the close relationship that Prime Minister Abe has with President Trump 
may not count for much at the end of the day, given the randomness in policy direction out of Washington. Um, and moving beyond a temporary repair of the China relationship will be a big challenge for Japan going forward. So things have calmed down a little bit um, from last year when North Korea uh, launched missiles into Japanese airspace, uh, but the underlying crisis has yet to be resolved. So these are some of the issues that we'll be talking about today, um, and we're joined by an expert um, group flown in from the United States and Japan and around Australia as well. So we're really delighted to, to have our guests, expert guests joining us today. You'll notice we've got a mixture of academics, think tankers, people from the media uh, and practitioners. So I think it's a, it's a good mix and hopefully will mean a good discussion. Um, just want to thank the Australia Japan Foundation um, for the, the funding support as well as the Japan Foundation, uh, which makes this possible, makes it possible on this scale that we want to run it at. Uh, and to thank and acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Kusaka and Mrs. Kusaka here, who are very strong supporters of our Japan update, but our ongoing work on Japan and the Australia-Japan relationship here at the, the ANU. Um, so we have a magazine, East Asia Forum Quarterly, which we launch every year at the update. That's titled Peak Japan. That's almost just in time delivery. It's coming from the printers as we speak. So we'll be here in the morning tea break. Um, but for now, uh, let me welcome the chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, former ambassador to Japan, Myra McLean, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shiro, and uh, uh, let me acknowledge uh, Ambassador Kasaka and Mrs. Kasaka. Uh, it's a wonderful pleasure once again to be here on behalf of the Australia Japan Foundation at this Japan update. The Australia Japan Foundation, which for those of you who may not be aware, is a government funded uh, body uh, that provides grants to encourage um, non official contact between Australia and Japan uh, has uh, been a, found, a founding partner of the Japan Update and we have in each year been very pleased with the tremendous variety and expertise that has been on display and the uh, fruitful discussions that have been held each time. Uh, so uh, the uh, Australia Japan Foundation is obviously very pleased to um, once again be here to support uh, the, this event. Let me uh, uh, very briefly introduce uh, our very distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Sheila Smith, who told me uh, when we were sitting down earlier that she was actually born in Scotland, um, uh, which I'm very pleased about because a lot of uh, Scottish heritage is uh, here in Australia, not least in my own family. Uh, but of course, she's um, an American through and through and very much uh, uh, a, a central part of the Council of, on Foreign Relations, where she is the senior fellow for Japanese or for Japan Studies, director of the Japan Studies program, and the project on Northeast Asian nationalisms and the U.S.-Japan alliance. She's a contributor to the Council on Foreign Relations.org, CFR.org, and the CFR's blog on Asia, Asia Unbound and author of Intimate Rivals, Japan's Domestic Politics and the Rise of China, published by Columbia Press in 2015. Uh, I understand she shortly uh, will be publishing her latest book, uh, Japan Rearmed: The Politics of Military Power, which will be published by Harvard. Um, and uh, that will be a book uh, that will be very timely indeed, and uh, I'm sure will, to a certain extent, uh, or in fact, quite a significant extent, will probably uh, be uh, the theme of her discussions today, in part at least. Uh, she is a, an extremely knowledgeable expert on Japan's foreign policy and security policy, and uh, at a time where the region is so un settled, if I can put it that way, uh, with the growth of China, with the North Korean crisis and with the doubts uh, pervading about um, Trump 
foreign policy in the region. Um, uh, this conference and her address, I'm sure, will be extremely timely. Let me uh, uh, please, please join me in welcoming Sheila. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for that lovely introduction. It's great to be here in Australia. It takes a long time to reach you, but I have been looking forward to reaching you for some time now. Um, I want to thank Professor Armstrong and Professor Drysdale, who is somewhere. <laughs> there you are. And also to the Australian Japan Research Center, everyone here for making my trip and my visit and today possible. I'm particularly honored uh, to be partnered with Ambassador McLean, Chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, and also to see Mr. and Mrs. Ambassador and Mrs. Kusaka again. If, if our conversation at the ambassador's residence last night is any indicator of today's conversation, we are going to have a very lively exchange. <laughs> uh, and so I am grateful for that introduction to my stay. Um, I was asked to come and talk, and I wasn't quite sure what peak Japan meant. So I was on my air, long airplane drive thinking, peak Japan, what does that mean? And I, I understand the demographic reference, but I was starting to think as an international relations scholar is apt to think about peaks and valleys and topography and landscapes and terrain and uncertainty. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what I see as, as Japan's challenges going forward, not problems. I don't think Japan actually is uh, as challenged as some, some writers think. Uh, it, but it does have some significant new challenges that I think cha will, will ask new questions uh, of Japanese decision makers, but also of the Japanese people as they attempt to devise their own well-being, prosperity, uh, and safeguard their security in the, in the years to come. It is a difficult landscape here in the Asia Pacific. Not least of all, it has been made more difficult in the last year and a half <clears throat> by the unpredictability of my country. and. Um, I apologize for that, but as you know, um, democracies are unpredictable, and I've been watching the Australian conversation about your democracy with some interest, so uh, to each their own. Um, I can't take full responsibility for mine, but I will attempt to at least try to explain it. Um, but I think there's every reason to, to feel confident that Japan will demonstrate the skill that it has always demonstrated diplomatically. Uh, and I think it's one of the under, underestimated aspects of Japanese foreign policy is the skill to which the, not only di the diplomats, Ambassador Kusaka among them, but the Japanese politicians are able to adapt and reform and, and meet the new challenges in the international environment. Um, but there are some things we can talk about today, and I'm going to talk about five of those. Um, we have policy reform issues at home, of course how Japan manages its demography, right? how Japan sustains its economic growth, how it you know, basically thinks about its political system, how it deals with leadership challenges. All of these matter in terms of how it will implement some of the things that I'm about to talk about. But we have a full day of conversation and other experts to, to, to grapple with that. What I thought I would do this morning to start us off is to talk about the world beyond Japan. Um, Japan can't control, like any other nation, even the United States, can't control everything that comes its way, right? The question is, what is coming its way? <laughs> what is different? What are the instruments it can bring to bear? And where do I think there is maybe some need to reconsider some of the supports that Japan has had in the past, one of which is the alliance with the United States? So I have five priorities that I considered really important for Japan's future. I'm going to talk about four of them. The last one is really about economics, trade, the global liberal order, and I think we're going to get into that in more detail later, and I am not an economist, so I will leave that to others. So, but let me share with you the five priorities that I think may be the most important for Tokyo. The first is, will Japan and China um, manage to stabilize their relations sufficiently so that the balance of power between them doesn't become the underpinning of crises after crisis, distrust and suspicion? We could easily imagine, and I, several years ago we did imagine, right, that this was a relationship that was fairly doomed to, current, to recurrent crisis. Uh, but I think we're on a little bit of steadier footing today. I don't know that we know yet whether that steady footing will hold, whether the foundation of Japan-China relations will remain uh, stable and predictable, or whether we're going to see just in and out phases of manageability and crisis. So China-Japan relations, I think, are, are one of the hugest priorities, I think, 
for Japanese decision makers. The second is clearly the North Korean missile and nuclear threat. Uh, it goes without saying, and we say it in Washington all the time, that if you are looking for any uh, situation that might result in military conflict in Asia, it's most likely to be on the Korean Peninsula. Post-Singapore summit, I am not relieved of the anxiety. Um, I'm not sure we have solved the problem, uh, unlike President Trump, who thinks that the nuclear threat has been diminished. I think it has been ter <coughs> temporarily receded. We are in a better place than we were in 2017 when the missiles were flying. Um, but I'm not sure we've solved the problem. And so for Japan, there's a two there's, it's two-folded. One is obviously the missile threat. Um, every other country in Northeast Asia has the capacity to retaliate, except for Japan. And that was a deliberate choice by the Japanese. I'm not sure that choice is going to hold, and I'll leave that discussion to our Q&A session. Um, the missile threat is one piece of the puzzle, but the other piece is obviously the nuclear threat. And that gets at the heart of the extended deterrent of the United States. Again, something that we're going to have to think carefully about, something that Japanese decision makers and policymakers have been engaging US policymakers with now carefully for a number of years, whether or not they are comfortable with the extent of American capability to exercise the nuclear deterrent. So there's two, face, there's two facets of the North Korea challenge. One is the immediacy of the missile threat. The second is this longer term structural question about whether extended deterrence is sufficient. The third priority I would suggest for Japan is, can it build partnerships across Asia that will help it manage, along with others, Australia included, uh, regional relations in a way that mitigates, at least, the impact of China's rising influence? I'm not saying contain China, obviously, but I'm thinking that there is a need for regional governance structures, be they in the economy, be they in security or, or, or in the diplomatic sphere, and we have relied largely on the ASEAN-centric notion of multilateralism for the region. I feel that the ASEAN, ASEAN is weaker today. It may not be up to the challenge of major power competition in the Asia Pacific. It may not. And we have to at least openly talk about uh, what is to be done if it is not, right? And one of those pieces of the puzzle, and I think it has been very well articulated in the Indo-Pacific strategy by Japan, embraced now in Australia, especially out in Western Australia. <laughs> Yay, Gordon. Um, but, um, and also now being in initially embraced uh, by the Trump administration as the framing of Trump's Asia strategy. I wrote very early on at the invitation of ANU that I wasn't quite sure Trump was ever going to have an Asia strategy. And I am changing my mind. We have seen now, I think, in Secretary of State Pompeo's articulation, a fairly clear American engagement with the idea of an Indo-Pacific strategy. And I am not a, a, an Indian spe specialist by any means, but clearly Prime Minister Modi has embraced an Indo-Pacific concept. They may be slightly different visions, but I think this is where the Japanese initiative on the Indo-Pacific could really bear fruit. But I think we've got two competing visions here of what kind of structures we're seeing emerge to deal with the myriad challenges in the region. Fourth, and this is the one where I'm sure you want me to talk most about, um, and that is whether the U.S.-Japan alliance is up to the task. Uh, this is a very difficult challenge for our policymakers at the moment, but it is a very difficult challenge, I think, for our alliances in general in the region. Uh, there's a lot of pressure being put on the U.S. alliances, be it the U.S. alliance with Japan, or even more visibly with the U.S. alliance with South Korea. Uh, and there is some new intellectual thinking uh, that needs to go into those alliances should we actually see a negotiation with North Korea bear fruit. I think the U.S.-Australia alliance is on very t firm terms, so I'm not worried. I don't know if that's good or bad for this audience, but I am less worried about our alliance. But I think in Northeast Asia, there are significant changes here that need to be accommodated by our alliance. The flip side of this for Japan, though, is will America's changing political understanding of its obligations abroad, especially its commitments through Article V protection of its allies. Are these fundamentally altering in the United States? And if so, that raises some very significant challenges, problems, questions, I think, for Tokyo's decision makers. And then finally, and I'm not going to belabor the point, we all understand it here, the global trading order, the global liberal economic order uh, may be deeply threatened by economic nationalism led by none other than us. 
Um, I'm not going to get into that too much here. We can talk about it if you'd like to in the Q&A. I'm happy to do that, but I'll leave that to our economists to discuss later. So let me focus a little bit on the, the first four and share a couple of thoughts in the, in the idea that we'll talk about them more openly together in a few minutes with Ambassador um, Murray here, with Murray rather, I'm sorry. Um, I, read, I wrote a book a couple of years ago on uh, Japan-China relations, mostly from the perspective of looking at domestic politics in Japan and how that was shaping the perceptions of, of China. Um, I think we've seen a fair amount of policy adaptation in Japan. And I got, uh, the book was translated um, last spring into Japanese. And I went and I had a lovely book launch in Tokyo. And many Japanese academics were there to help me celebrate the book. But every one of them said to me, why are you so critical of Japan? <laughs> <laughs> I talked about policy adaptation. And I was talking about it's not accommodation. It's not confrontation. It is what we would expect when power relations shift. It is adaptation. And it's the same thing the United States is doing. It's the same thing any other country is doing. You have a new significant center of economic and political and now military power, you will adapt. You have to, right? So for me, that was a neutral term. But in Tokyo, it was viewed with criticism that I was saying that Japan was adapting and that was a bad thing. Um, just so we all are clear here, I think it's a positive, and I mean it in a positive but neutral, neutral sense. Um, the adaptation in Tokyo, though, has been ad hoc. It's been issue by issue. And I think you're only now beginning to see the strategic underpinnings of a, of a fairly significant shift uh, of Japanese thinking about how it's going to live in the region, how it's going to build relations with China as much as possible, um, and it's how it's going to think about the military implications of China's military power. Um, I think military tensions worried both Xi Jinping and Abe Shinzo, which led to their meeting at the APEC uh, and led to the discussion that was ongoing for years on risk reduction in the East China Sea. Uh, that conversation in and of itself is positive. Uh, it's not necessarily going to avoid tensions or military crises, but it is a better place than where we were in 2012. Um, I think the Prime Minister of Japan has also been very adroit and astute in uh, making sure that the economic underpinnings of the relationship got back on track to embed the relationship and the economic benefits of both countries. I think, as, as Shiro said, in October, we're going to see the Prime Minister visit uh, Beijing, and I think, again, you're going to see a, a reassertion of the economic interest, the common interest, shared interest between the Japanese and Chinese that has been the steadying force, I think, in that bilateral relationship. But other things have changed, too. Both President Trump and President Obama have reasserted American Article 5 protections ex that they extend to the Senkaku Islands, and that has helped Beijing achieve some clarity uh, on the military pressures that they may put on the islands in the East China Sea. So the alliance has also adapted. Uh, and we have now a fairly in, uh, good conversation, not possibly as good as it could be, but good conversation on how do we de-escalate crises before they reach the level of military tensions. And so the alliance now is not just about defense and deterrence, it's also uh, about making sure that the crises don't rise to the level that they rose in 2012, where we were seriously concerned about some kind of miscalculation. Again, I won't belabor the point here, but I'm looking forward to the October visit uh, of Prime Minister Abe to Beijing to see also how China and Japan um, talk about the region. How OBOR, or the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, meets the free and open and reciprocal Indo-Pacific. And so I think all of us should listen to the rhetoric um, and listen to the statements, and I suspect we'll hear slight dissonance. We might have a very friendly meeting, but a very different interpretation of the economic potential and the roles of both countries in the Asia Pacific. And I'm looking forward to hearing that. So second, is, second challenge, North Korea. I don't know what to say about North Korea. <clears throat> I'm, I lived in Washington throughout the 2016-2017 iterated accelerated missile tests. I, we could talk all about reactions to that, but you, you lived in the region, you know them as well as anybody, so I won't go over that history. We all know that the bulk of those missiles were aimed in Japan's direction. Uh, and they were no longer pseudo-civilian tests of satellite launches. They were clearly missile tests. They were military tests, uh, and they were designed in, in a way to make Japan very aware of the fact that North Korea not only had one or two missiles, but they had batteries of missiles that could be launched at any point in time, and that the Japanese were vulnerable to them. Um, and I think that message was received loud and clear. 
I think our government decided that it was not to be accepted, uh, as did the Japanese government. Um, I think we had an interesting moment in, in the fact that the South Koreans didn't have leadership on the ground at that time. So Japan-U.S. conversation was the preeminent response uh, to, by the alliances to that initial testing of Kim Jong-un. Um, I think what we've got now is, or what we saw on display in 2017 was an unprecedented level of synchronized military signaling by both alliances. You saw military exercises being conducted in Korea in response to a launch over Japan. You saw Japanese missile defense exercises synchronized by the US ROK uh, missiles on the second long range test. So it was an interesting moment. I think US and Japanese forces were trying to push the envelope a little bit with their South Korean colleagues about exercising more explicitly together. But as we all know here, that that's a, that's a tender topic for South Koreans. And so we didn't see that move into a full trilateralized military uh, demonstration of the alliance response. Then we had the surprise of the Singapore summit. Um, I'm not here to say it was wrong of the president to meet with Kim Jong-un. I, in fact, thought that was not a bad idea. Um, we have had every kind of negotiation with North Korea, except at the leadership level. It was worth a try in my book. Um, what came out of it, though, and it, from the very initial statement by President Trump after the meeting with Kim Jong-un, what came out of it was alarming to me. And I suspect it was deeply unsettling in Tokyo. And that was the statement by our president that war that, that war, um, what do you call it, war, war games, thank you, war games were provocative, uh, and not only that, they were expensive, right? So you had two messages from the United States to its ally uh, in South Korea. One, uh, the North Koreans had it right. We didn't have a legitimate right to do these exercises. And two, uh, the burden-sharing argument was front and center after diplomacy, immediate diplomacy with Kim Jong-un. Bad mistake, both of them, in my, my view. We can certainly debate that. Um, more alarming, though, was the president's statement that the nuclear threat had, to, had it was taken care of. And what I think you've had since the Singapore summit till now is I think you've had a very serious effort by Secretary of State Pompeo to make Kim Jong-un make good on his promises, but it has not reaped much benefit. Uh, so we now have a situation in which there's no immediate military threat, but there's no resolution, resolution of the military problem. And I suspect the longer that goes on, the more uncomfortable it will be in Tokyo. Uh, and I hope that somewhere along the way, we start to see something, the gears mesh. Uh, the president has announced that he's not going to really take it on now until after China and the United States resolve their trade disputes. So it has become a very complicated story. It is no longer a story of defense and deterrence, which, which is, in my view, what it should be. It is now a very difficult story embroiled with the US relationship with China, again. If I were sitting in Tokyo, I would be uneasy. Um, we can talk about the what ifs. There's several scenarios we can spin out from here on North Korea. None of them, I think, are particularly positive for Japan. Uh, but we can, let's save that for the discussion. Japan and the regional order, number three, and I'll be very brief here because it's well known in this, in this audience. Um, the competitive vision with China's rise may on the surface today be dissipated somewhat in Tokyo, but I don't think it's gone. Uh, and this is where we're on the, this is where we have to think about the Asia Pacific uh, in, a, in a very concrete sort of way. It may now rest on the powers in the Asia Pacific, Japan, Australia, India, and maybe a little bit the United States, uh, to lead a conversation about how to avoid that competitive dynamic from becoming the norm. Um, I'm hoping it will happen. I think Japan has been um, I think Prime Minister Abe and his team have been exceptional on TPP. I was quite happy to see TPP 11 continue and now the CPTPP. Um, I was very happy to see the Japan-EU trade agreement. Um, I think now you're seeing also infrastructure talks with us uh, for the region as well as with Australia and others. Uh, the Japan, as I mentioned earlier, the Japan-India conversation is very constructive as well. So I think we're seeing signs here of fairly dynamic and adaptive and positive diplomacy, and I hope I'm looking forward to seeing its results. Um, the Japanese now are acting uh, on maritime issue, uh, maritime presence issues with us and with you and with others. Uh, also very positive. I think the, the largest destroyer is out in the South China Sea today, the Kaga. Uh, the Izumo was out several months ago. Um, I think this is positive for Japan, that collective action on maritime security in Asia is the way to go. 
And so I'm looking forward to continuing to watch Japan um, develop that capacity. So I think the Indo-Pacific vision and Japan's framing of it um, gives us a lot to think about. And I will look forward to hearing from those of you here in Australia about what you think of, the, of, in, of Australia's vision and how we can, and the United States, continue to articulate that as a priority for the United States. There is always that subcurrent of historical memory in the region. Um, I see South Korea and China have stepped back a bit from their pressure on Japan. It helps that we are somewhat distant from the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. I don't underestimate the power that that kind of diplomacy has, however, in weakening uh, the region's ability to work together. Um, let me then conclude with a few thoughts about the U.S.-Japan partnership. I've probably spoken for too long, but I will try to make it brief. Um, or I could go on about it forever. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a handicap at the moment. Um, but the U.S.-Japan alliance, of course, has been the foundation of Japan's post-war strategy. Uh, not only in military terms, but in economic terms as well. Um, but it is, and the surface story of the moment, of course, is the relationship between Prime Minister Abe and President Trump. I wrote about it. I, I continue to write about it when invited. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I recognize that that's a, that's a critical part of Japanese management of our political transition. Um, and I, I appreciate that. I do not think, however, that that personal relationship is sufficient to ensure that the alliance is strong. And so I think we should be realistic and clear about it, that it is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a strong U.S.-Japan relationship. Um, I think that this is the best, and I think I wrote about it um, in the, the EAQ, that's, uh, EAFQ that's about to come momentarily. Um, it is the best example of alliance management of our president that we've had. And I don't say that in any, with any kind of cynicism. I think Prime Minister Abe deserves an awful lot of credit. It was a risky maneuver. It could have gone badly, but it didn't. Uh, it redounded to Japan's benefit, and so he deserves credit for that. I think it also is to be noted that Prime Minister Abe continues to make sure that that is the mechanism through which he articulates Japan's needs in the alliance. And I think that's the right strategy with this president and where we are today in Washington in terms of our policymaking process. We don't have a normal alliance management structure. We have a lot of positions unfilled. They are gradually getting filled. So we are getting back to what you would normally expect in terms of the way our government works. But it is important that that leader, leader channel gets Japan's interests and priorities communicated clearly to the president. But the story, I think, is not all about Trump. So if you'll hold, bear with me for a second, I'm going to take a step back um, and take a sweep for, uh, on the U.S.-Japan alliance over the, over the post-war period. And I'll do it very quickly so we won't bore you too much. But this is not the first time the United States and Japan have talked about military burden sharing, right? It's not the first time we've talked about our trade deficit. We've had moments where that has created deep tensions and frictions in our political system in the United States and likewise in Japan. We have weathered them. We have adapted on both sides. And we have managed to figure it out. Um, what's different this time, though, are two things. In the past, those moments of tension, those claims that the alliance is unfair or inequitable, um, have largely come from our legislative branch. They come from our Congress, where the politics of trade competition or the politics of burden sharing, right, uh, have seen imperative to our elected officials. Now it's coming from the executive branch. And that's important to recognize because it has different implications for how the alliance is managed. Uh, I think what I feel in Washington is, in fact, a little bit of pushback from our Congress. This is a little footnote. I spend more time briefing congressional representatives in the Senate and in the House today than I ever had in my 10 years in, in, at CFR. Um, we get asked by all Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. They ask for us to come and talk to them about Japan. And I do it a lot. So there's a lot of demand from the Hill on some of these issues. And I think that's an interesting engagement uh, because I think our Congress is worried about the state of our alliances. Um, but back to the burden sharing and trade, we have, we have done this before. It's been unpleasant and uncomfortable, but the alliance has not ended, right? We've negotiated our way through it. Uh, we can do it again if we have to. Uh, I think the, the 1980s era, which was the most uncomfortable, uh, was, is what's still stuck in President Trump's mind. He still remembers that era, uh, economically in particular, and you'll hear it in his references. Um, but I think he also sees, does, has a vision of Japan and its military capability that is, is lodged in a different era as well. 
So last November when he visited Japan, he asked the Prime Minister why he didn't just shoot down those North Korean missiles. Right? <laughs> okay then. Um, this is also not the first U.S. President to deal out shocks to Japan, right? We can go back to the Nixon administration, right? Um, one of the things that I think is uneasy, even for the Prime Minister, uh, is that there were no consultations on Section 232, steel and aluminum. There were no consultations on the Singapore summit, right? And that's very reminiscent of the Nixon shocks. Uh, we are not calling them the Trump shocks, although I did sort of satirically say that in one of my essays, and my Japanese colleagues said, shh, shh, we don't see it like that. We don't see it like that. Okay. So, um, but we've been here before, and the thing is that we are going to have to be here again. The one piece of the puzzle where I feel that we have a, a lot more homework to be done is if we have a real crisis, if we have real military pressure from North Korea. And if you can look at last year as uh, some insight into how that would be managed, I am actually more positive than you might think because we have such deep integration of our military forces and our security planners and our strategic community that I don't think you would have a situation where the alliance would fail. Fingers crossed. But we are going to have some ugly politics, I, I'm afraid, in the fall and maybe into the spring. And largely this will revolve around trade, but it could also revolve around the North Korea issue. Um, what is different, I think, for Japan today is that Episodes like this in the past, where the alliance has come, has been shaken, or confidence in the alliance has been shaken, is that they have usually been in periods of reduced threat. They were after the Vietnam War, right? The Guam Doctrine, right? Jimmy Carter trying to draw down troops in, in Korea. They were not moments of explicit threat to Japan. Um, they are now. And so the geopolitical temperature <laughs> and the American response is very disconnected from these episodes that we've watched the alliance navigate in the past. And I worry then about, and I'll be looking forward to the conversation we're going to have with our Japanese colleagues in a few minutes, I worry then about Japanese anxiety about the predictability or the unpredictability of the United States. I worry then that there are serious thinkers in Japan that are beginning to say, I'm not sure we should have all our eggs in the US basket. And so we've got some real traditional kind of questions about hedging. We've got questions about Japan's capacities. We've got questions about Japanese military power, I think, on the horizon, that it would be wise for serious thinkers in Tokyo to grapple with, and to grapple with out loud. Because I think it is, it is almost, uh, it, it is probably likely that many people in Washington will take for granted that Japan is not worried because Japan doesn't have other options. So I think there is some serious thinking to be had in Tokyo and I see some of that thinking beginning and I'm hoping that we can talk more about that in the later discussion. So let me offer you three basic conclusions about how I look at Japanese foreign policy and cha its particular challenges it has today. There is a question about how much flexibility Japan does have. My colleagues in, in the Japanese government have often said to me, we don't have a choice. We only have the alliance. But I don't think that's true. I don't say it in a black and white kind of way. I say it is, there's a lot of room here for collective action with other partners. And I think that's what you're seeing with the Australia-Japan relationship. Uh, I think that's what you're seeing in other aspects of the Japan-European relationship at the moment. And I think that the, it would be wise for Tokyo to create opportunity for flexibility um, because I think there is a little bit of a question about the predictability of my country going forward. I don't call that hedging. I simply call it diversification. Japan is very good at diplomatic diversification. It always has been, whether it's the post-war period or the pre-war period for that matter. I think more successful in the post-war. So I think that's a good strategy for Japan. The second conclusion I'll offer for discussion is Japan is developing more instruments of statecraft, and by that, I, that's what my subject of my book is, and that is the military instrument, is more comfortable today uh, for Japanese decision makers than it has been in the past. That's not to say Japan is turning to the right or Japan is about to attack its neighbors. Please don't misunderstand me. Japan has deployed its military in, in collective activities that it sees as necessary to sustaining the peaceful order in the Asia Pacific. It has donated those services to the United Nations peacekeeping it understands the importance of having that instrument to communicate 
its investment in those goals regionally and globally. I think that's a good thing. Diplomacy is a skill the Japanese have had uh, in, in, in abundance. Collective action with new partners, as I said, is the best road. I think the economic influence of Japan, that economic instrument is the one it is going to be more difficult to wield. And that is not because the Japanese are not good at it, it's because they have competition. <laughs> China has a lot more economic resources. We're watching it, right, <coughs> unfold. Um, and they, they are not shy. I was watching the leadership meeting with the African nations. We all think that that actually is, could be a positive development conversation, but we're leery about the way in which China is going to deploy those resources and that influence. Japan can't compete with that. I'm not sure we can either. Collectively, maybe we can. And again, uh, those that, that, that recalibration of Japanese strategic instruments is pro probably um, important to recognize as we move into a potential phase of major power com uh, competition. Let me just conclude on something that obvious, is obvious to this audience, and that is regional partnerships with or without the United States. As an American, I believe strongly that with is better. <laughs> um, but I think for those of you here in the region, I understand that with or without these regional partnerships are going to be a priority. And so that is the, not only in bilateral terms, that is one of the key significances, I think, of the increasing closeness of Japan and Australia in terms of how you think and speak and develop opportunities for collaboration across the Asia Pacific. It matters. It matters particularly given our politics, but it matters more importantly for the future peace and stability of the region. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith. It's uh, really... Uh, a fantastic tour de raison, as we would say, and uh, flagging all the major issues. And uh, obviously, you could have given a keynote speech on all of the um, points that you made. Uh, and uh, I think it's very good that this, uh, this session will be followed immediately after by, as it were, a broadening out of some of the points that you've been making. So we only have 10 minutes for, for Q&As uh, before morning tea. And uh, uh, I wonder if somebody would like to ask the first question, please. Yes, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, Sheila, for a real tour de force, a comprehensive uh, review of where the Japan-US relationship is at. Um, uh, as you said, uh, the questioning of the alliance relationship and uh, the, the fussing about the trade deficit is not new, uh, but uh, the circumstances under which this is taking place now are really fundamentally different from anything that we've had in the past. Uh, and one of the circumstances I, I want to highlight is one that you didn't mention and ask you about. Uh, is, is that which, in which uh, the assault on, on, on the trade side uh, is not just a, an assault uh, on, on Japan, it's assault on, on the whole system, economic security system with, within which Japan has been nested in the post-war period. And it and threatens to bring that down. Already the trade rules have been broken uh, in this respect and, uh, and uh, 232 does it again. Uh, so... Uh, uh, you know, this is a deep security issue. It's not just an economic security issue for Japan. Uh, and I wonder what you think about the comprehension of that in Washington, because at times there seems to be no comprehension of that and what it means for Japan's not only managing its relationships with the United States, but also its relationship, its big relationship, extant relationship with China, not its potential relationship with China. So a uh, reflection on that would be most helpful. The second uh, question is um, Indo-Pacific. Uh, everybody asks everybody else what their idea of the Indo-Pacific is. And, uh, you know, we all sort of scratch around and think about what our idea of the Indo-Pacific is. But I'd like you to spell out a little bit more what you think Washington's idea yeah. of the Indo-Pacific <laughs> is. Uh, is it principally a maritime security framework arrangement or or has it much substance beyond that? The substance that Pompeo outlined in Singapore was not much substance, really, in terms of hard cash on the table and so on. And 
instruments, defining instruments for action on the Indo-Pacific. So I wonder if you could tell us uh, what Washington's idea of the Indo-Pacific strategy is. As always, um, very great question. So let me deal with the liberal order, the liberal trading order, economic order first. And so I, I think you're right. It's not just the U.S. behavior that's challenging the liberal order, right? And from Japan's perspective, in a devastating kind of way, I would say it's China. Um, but it's both. And so one of the things I'm going to be interested in hearing about when Prime Minister Abe goes in October is whether Xi Jinping tries to court Japan as a fellow partner in sustaining the liberal trading order. We all watched Xi Jinping speak right, at Davos about China being the great champion uh, of the liberal trading order. But I suspect there will be a little bit of a campaign there on the part of the Chinese to at least rhetorically uh, continue that thrust. But <clears throat> I ended my intimate rivals with a couple of paragraphs about what this is really all about for Japan. And it is really all about the order within which Japan Re, uh, reasserted its interests in the world stage. Uh, without the post-war order, as you point out, uh, the way it is, Japan is deeply challenged. And I don't see, and again, I'm looking for maybe our colleagues in the next session can, can address this more directly than I. Um, I know that that anxiety exists, Peter. I don't know and hear much of a debate about, well, what if? What if that's what happens? Because I think many people don't want to recognize, not only in Japan, but in Europe as well. The thing about Japan, though, it doesn't have the protection of the European Union, right? It doesn't have the comfort, even though the European Union is under stress. There's a partnership there. There's an economic partnership. And Japan would be hard pressed to create a new one. That's why I think CPTPP is important. That's why I think some of the regional initiatives that the Japanese are pushing for in the region, along with Australians and others, are so important, because that framework of a sturdy regional economic order is probably the right way to think about the what if. Now, I, we could spend a long time thinking about the Chinese challenge to the post-war order. I suspect, although I can't with great confidence predict, um, I suspect that President Trump will be given a great run for his money uh, if, his, if and when, because I think it actually is going to be when, they announced the 232 application on autos. Um, there are so many interests inside the United States that will respond to that. And again, there are others on the panel today who may have a different view of this. Um, the politics of that inside the United States, let alone the devastation it would do to our economic relations across Canada, Mexico, Asia, um, will, be, will be strong. Um, and the consumers in the United States will, have, will feel it fast. Right? It may take us years to undo the damage of the imposition of 232 on the auto industry. Right? Um, so I think the Americans will rectify this. I don't see us going through a full-on full economic nationalist beggar thy neighbor purge. But I can't say that with great confidence, because I don't think any of us could know exactly how this conversation inside the United States is going to emerge. But there will be pushback, for sure, on autos in a way that there weren't for steel and aluminum. One, one more very brief question we have time for. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks again for your comments. It's been very interesting. Um, you mentioned that you don't think ASEAN um, would have the, the, the might or the ability uh, to assist uh, the regional players in creating a new regional order that could both accommodate or, as you would say, adapt to the rise of China. Given if that is the case and Japan's strained relationships with historical um, reasons with China and South Korea, what other option do they really have um, India, I don't think, well, you said that um, you think India had a, a, a vision of the Indo-Pacific which aligned somewhat with the Australian, Japanese and US. But my reading of Modi's speech from the Shangri-La dialogue was a little bit different. Um, and we obviously know that they have a long history of non-alignment and whether they help RCEP or make it worse is up for debate. So I would like to hear your thoughts on whether Japan should put a full press into the ASEAN 
uh, region or whether they should prioritise, as we all need to, um, other players, and if so, who would they be and why would it be better than ASEAN? Since time is short, I'll try and be very brief. Sorry about no, 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 no. It's me. I think I'm answering in a lengthy way. So let me try to answer succinctly. And also, I, in, the, in, in the same way, address Peter's question about Indo-Pacific. Um, I don't mean to suggest that it's an either or. So the ASEAN, Japanese commitment to the ASEAN is deep and has, has been longstanding. You can go back to the, to the 1992 support for the ASEAN Regional Forum. Japan has deeply engaged and invested and supported in uh, ASEAN-based multilateralism. So I'm not saying that Japan is not. Um, I think we have to recognize so that the major power competitions that are emerging are putting some strains on the ASEAN, especially on the, on their dividing maritime from continental. There's other kinds of strains afoot. Uh, it will be very hard for the ASEAN going forward to feel the full brunt of major power competition. And again, we, we, you know better than I that ASEAN was formed to protect the Southeast Asian nations from major power competition, right? It will be all that they can do to do that, I think, without taking on the mitigation of the tensions between major powers, right? So that's the context within which I was talking about ASEAN's challenges. Um, Japan, I think, will continue to play a very strong role in supporting the Southeast Asian nations and in ASEAN uh, institutionally. I don't think the Indo-Pacific is an either or either. Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. The Modi-Abe dialogue is not a complete integration of their visions of an Indo-Pacific, but there's enough overlap there that I think it's constructive. Um, I think there's also what's different from Japan's articulation if, from the United States, which is underdeveloped to say politely, <laughs> uh, where we are at the moment in Washington, um, is that Japan looks to Africa. I mean, the Indo-Pacific is two oceans, three continents, and the Japanese, you know, if you look at the MOFA website, they're very explicit. It's very expansive. It's not major powers necessarily. It's functions and oceans and continents. But it has a very deep resonance. Japan's entry into Africa on the other side of the Indian Ocean, or on the other side of the South Asian, um, is also a very important part of its strategic play with China. So connectivity, infrastructure development, all of these economic uh, components of the Indo-Pacific strategy for Japan have, have very significant strategic value, I think, in terms of Japanese presence. The United States doesn't have that. I, we have a very narrow rendition of Indo-Pacific, and I think Secretary Pompeo's speech was welcomed because it, was, it happened. <laughs> and I was happy to see it not be about the South China Sea, to be it about our economic interests. He didn't use the word connectivity, but he talked about digital energy and infrastructure. <clears throat> so we're starting to scoot over a little bit to that economic conception of a space in which we can work with Australia and India and Japan across this vast region. The strategic vision is not there. The closest I heard of a strategic vision was Rex Tillerson's speech early on, and as we know, that is not, that is not the, the game plan that I hear coming out of Secretary Pompeo. So I think it's okay, Peter, that it's still it is still focused on economics. I wouldn't want it to get over abrasive at this point, given everything else that's going on. Thank you very much, Sheila. And uh, before I um, close, I just wanted to throw in one little uh, additional issue, which uh, perhaps could be discussed in the next session, and that is, Taiwan is rarely mentioned these days, yeah. but Taiwan is always there as an issue um, and could be the touchstone of, well, it would bring, yeah. it would yeah. draw in the United States back into the region yeah. again if there were a move, uh, not necessarily a classic invasion by China, but uh, perhaps a pressuring of, of, of Taiwan and to uh, what, what does the United States yeah. do in that situation and, of course, what does Japan and Australia do in that situation? I'm not expecting you to respond now, but well, perhaps that's something we can talk Absolutely. about a bit later. But thank you very, very much uh, for your uh, wonderful uh, opening uh, remarks and uh, the keynote speech. It's really set the tone for the rest of the day and thank you again for thank coming you. all the way to Canberra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.